Hello, everybody. Welcome to ICMDA webinars. Uh, I'm Dr. John Greenall. And I'm Associate CEO of the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK. You may have noticed that I'm not Peter Saunders, um, who is the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. Um, but I'm standing in for him today as he is away in, uh, uh, in his homeland um, of New Zealand. Now, ICMDA brings together over 60,000 Christian dentists and doctors in over 80 countries worldwide. Uh, and today we are privileged um, to have Dr. Moira Leng speak to us on the subject of palliative care in low resource and fragile settings. I suspect that many of you are working in a similar area or you've got some experience um, of where you are. So it's great to have you with us today uh, listening. And I'm delighted uh, that Dr. Lang is with us today. Dr. Lang is a specialist palliative care physician, uh, currently holding two roles as head of palliative care uh, in Makerere University, Uganda, and is medical director of Cardius International Palliative Care Trust, Scotland. And I've probably just said that name very wrong, uh, and she will correct me in a moment. Uh, Moira trained, trained as a doctor in internal medicine in Aberdeen University, and then specialised uh, in palliative medicine from there. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and took up a senior consultant and honorary lecturer position at Aberdeen University. Um, she has a, a particular interest in international palliative care, and is committed to working alongside partners in the developing world to build capacity, offer mentorship, support curriculum development and new models of care. And since 1998, that's 25 years by my, uh, by my maths today, she's travelled to Eastern Europe and extensively within India, uh, as well as Africa, uh, and left the NHS in 2005 to allow her to work full time in international uh, settings. Uh, Dr. Lang, it is a privilege to have you with us today. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing more of your presentation. So I'm going to hand over to you now, if that's okay. Thank you so much. And that was a very generous introduction. Okay, so I want to not give you, and I'm sorry if you joined wanting uh, what is palliative care. If that's what you want, there's a website below for Cardis. John, you did a good job. Cardis is a Gaelic for friendship. And we set this up as a, a way to build capacity for palliative care, but with compassion, uh, with Christ's compassion at the center. And we're involved in a number of places. But I wanted to distill uh, the, the years of experience into just thinking about transformation in healthcare and how palliative care for me is one of those tools for transformation. And, and when we think of transformation in the broadest sense, I think that distills itself in meaning, in hope, in purpose, in so many of the things that we explore in palliative care. And so I want to think of this transformative paradigm. But to start with a brief moment of meditation, I've been part of a Northumberland Monastery communion, uh, commu uh, community uh, started before COVID. And that rhythm of liturgy and prayer, I found very helpful. And this really spoke to me. When we look at someone, whether it's our colleague, whether it's our patients, what do we really see? Whichever way we turn, oh God, there is your face in the light of the moon and patterns of stars, in sacred mountain rifts and ancient groves, in mighty seas and creatures of the deep. Whichever way we turn, oh God, there is your face in the light of eyes we love, in the salt of tears we have tasted, in weathered countenances east and west, in the soft skin glow of the child everywhere. Whichever way we turn, O oh God, there is your face. There is your face among us. Um, a meditative poem by John Philip Newell. And we come into palliative care where we walk with people in times of suffering, in times of questions that are difficult, if not impossible to answer. And we see them as our fellow human beings. We see in them the face of God. And when I want to talk about transformation today, I want to come to the heart of palliative care, holistic care for people living with chronic illnesses, which includes the quality of life of that living, but also the quality of life of the end 
end the dying time, very precious and important time, but not the whole of palliative care, and on to supporting families and bereavement. And I want to think about this transformational model in lives and practices and systems and in societies. And what is at the core? Values-based holistic care, promoting dignity can mean different things to different people. Of course, the relief of suffering, the demonstration of compassion, not just the empathy, but the demonstration of compassion. And alongside that, for me, particularly when I think of the inequalities in our world, and I'm going to say something about those, fighting for justice. And I love this verse from 2 Corinthians. We're all on that journey of transformation. We're all being transformed more and more into the image of our savior. Um, and that's what we do together. And as an ICMDA family, we do that together, don't we? We become more and more like our Lord together in his mission um, for this world. You've summarized very nicely the experience. I did this map uh, for a, another meeting recently, but this just shows some of the places I've had the incredible privilege of working in palliative care. And I want to bring some thoughts from different settings. Perhaps more of my interest these days is looking at uh, humanitarian settings and those fragile communities. I'll talk about that later, but I bring to you just some of that experience. And of course, the more you learn, the more you know that you need to learn. And I'm humbled by the people I've worked with and those I've learned from, and I'm sharing that with you today. There's a new WHO indicator uh, document. And if you want to know more of the nuts and bolts of palliative care, go and find this. It's last year. It's absolutely excellent. And it pictures palliative care as a house where you've got the provision of services as the roof. You've got these pillars of education and training and essential medicines. And here we often think of morphine. It's not just morphine, but morphine is one of the essential medicines. We think of underpinning evidence base. And then of course, the foundations for this house are policy work, but, and I'm glad to see this in this new uh, diagram, empowered families and communities. And I think we need to think of all of that with the people with palliative care needs. And those are the patients and their family and carer context at the heart of that. And there's a number of very helpful indicators that you can look at if you are setting up services or want to know more. And I would encourage you to do that. But does it make sense for this gentleman, uh, an amazing man I met in the refugee camps in the north of Uganda um, where we've been doing some, some work. And he was telling me how they built a 1000 seater mud a church. And his request for me was, can you find us some Bibles in the Bari language? So the needs may not be the ones that we expect, but we need to be able to listen and it needs to make sense for a gentleman like this. Okay, so let me just give you some snapshots as to why this is important. Here's something that just shows us the, the kind of um, map, if you like, of palliative care and anywhere that's pale blue is in trouble on this map. And you can see I'm sitting in India where there've been amazing developments palliative care and yet so much more to be done and you look at South America at the Middle East at um, Southeast Asia and Africa this is one of the greatest health inequalities in this map I want you to look at it for a moment it's actually the Lancet Commission it's a map in which the the size of the country on the picture is relating to the amount of pain control that's available as measured by access to oral morphine which is a good um Indicator. Now you see some bloated countries, and there's a lot of attention on the countries where there may be and there is an opiate opiate problem. But when we're looking at the legal access to drugs to control severe pain for conditions such as cancer, not just cancer, look at how the rest of the world simply disappears. How think of the millions of people represented in this diagram that have no access to anything other than. Uh, paracetamol, non-steroidals, and maybe some codeine-containing medication. This is not right. And I've had the privilege of working with many, many places to, to, to look at this map and being inspired by many colleagues on the ground to, to address this. It's an abyss of healthcare gap. And maybe some of you in this call are already engaged on this. I can see names I know, but maybe others will be challenged by a map such as this to seek justice for those in need. 
This report also coined a new term, serious health-related suffering. And I hope this will become more and more embedded in our thinking, not just uh, dailies, the, the activity life years or the qualies, but what actually is the suffering component of those days? Of course, you may ask me, how do we measure that? There's lots of ideas around that. But let's just look at this graph for a moment. This took the figures from the Lancet Commission and extrapolated and showed that in lower middle, low income, countries um, and upper middle income countries, there's going to be a huge increase in people living with chronic illness. And that is the population for palliative care. Now, I want to say upfront, palliative care is mostly delivered by non-specialists. A lot of my time is working alongside and supporting colleagues from primary care, from other, other uh, hospital specialties, from communities. But it's going to be an increasing problem. So those maps you show are going to get worse. There's another interesting report. These are just a few snapshots for you to go and read more if you'd like to. But the quality of death index. Many people think of palliative care, of end of life care. It's, it's not just that, but that is important. And this is a kind of score, if you like. The UK still comes top with other countries coming close behind. Um, and two uh, lower income countries come on the bottom here, Uganda and India. But of course, not every country is represented. But there are high income countries with poor quality of care, like Saudi, although it is changing. And there are countries like Uganda and Costa Rica where low incomes, but are showing an improvement. So the model of care is also important. And people took this map, and I'm sorry, this is a bit busy. Don't worry about the detail of it just now. And they did some really interesting research using experts from that country, but also did some work asking patients and families what were their preferences for care? So they kind of interrogated that piece of work. And they were finding some very interesting things. For example, a lot of countries dropped out the top. In fact, leaving only six scoring grade A. America dropped significantly down. And there's a lot of issues. You can read this report if you'd like to see more why that is. Um, but the problem is there. But I also found this fascinating. They asked patients and families what their key um, care options would be. What would they like most? And yes, pain control is there and it should be there. People should not needlessly be in pain. But they also ask for things that we sh they should be basic, shouldn't they? A clean space and kindness and appropriate treatments. They want the treatments alongside the palliative care. And that, of course, is the model and paradigm that we all work with alongside um, disease modifying treatments go the holistic management. And just one last thought in terms of looking at this global picture. This is the floods in Pakistan. We're looking at the earthquake uh, in Turkey and Syria. We're, we're hearing of storms even now off Madagascar and Mozambique. Planetary change, climate change is disproportionately going to affect those who are already fragile. And that, as, that must be part of our thinking and part of our Christian response. There is a term called fragile settings. If you're not aware of it, again, you can, you can have a look at the detail of this. But it's a way to understand not just the places where there's active conflict or a natural disaster, but the countries next door. Those where there's political instability or weak health systems or a high burden of disease or protracted emergencies. And I think you look at this map and you're not surprised to see many countries in Africa, but also in the Middle East and Afghanistan showing on this map. So what does palliative care mean in those settings? What does it mean for people on the move? It's estimated this year that there's going to be one in seven people, either refugees or internally displaced. 1% of the world's population actually higher than that now. Most of them in neighboring countries, not in high income countries, and most of them um, being looked after by a small number of countries. Germany, the only European nation on here, and Turkey, which has been incredibly generous to refugees and migrants itself now under pressure with the, with the earthquake. What's our response to that? Do we see, uh, do we join in that feel that migrants are somehow a threat, or do we see people as? the face of God? Do we see those who are displaced as people to care for and to love and to support and to welcome and to see how we can promote dignity for them? 
These are beautiful sculptures. Some of you may have seen them by somebody called Bruno Catalano. Uh, he himself was a migrant. And he paints them, he talks about the missing pieces in migration, the things left behind, the spaces, the losses. But he also talks about walking towards a better future and having hope. And as we think of palliative care, we have to begin to talk about what does hope mean? And do we see migrants also as people who might bring creativity, ideas, wealth in that richness to us? I've had the privilege of working in Gaza for the last eight years. I'm going to be there again in about 10 days. And it's an amazing place with amazing people under the most unimaginable oppression and struggle. And there's a word which my Gaza students use when we're talking about spiritual distress. It's a world, it's an Arabic world which says, our world has been shaken, a phrase. And I think for me that represents the distress that is at the heart of suffering. And much of that distress will be spiritual. Of course, we talk about the financial, the social, the physical, the emotional, but at the heart of much of the distress is that lack of meaning and hope and purpose. What do we say to people whose world has been take, take, shaken? Or oh, how do we respond to people whose world has been shaken? So let me now just run through some, some principles and ways at which we can approach palliative care in fragile settings. Um, we've had excellent documentation from the WHO. I love this document because it talks about how quality must be there. And one of the values of quality is compassion. And isn't that a lovely uh, uh, acknowledgement of the role that we have in bringing compassion uh, into these settings? But let me just give you some specifics. Here's some amazing work that's been done in, um, in India, but also with EHA hospitals and uh, EMMS, but also in Malawi, uh, Jane Bates, a wonderful paper, which talks about how palliative care, making better choices, giving people information, helping support them at home, may in fact reduce poverty. Re really, really important in our fragile settings so that people are making the right decisions for them. When we're doing our training, are we using a transformational learning approach where actually we engage in complexity and in the behaviors and attitudes and beliefs that underpin what we do, not just in the knowledge and skill? And I'm going to give you some examples of that. Do we design clinical care that is integrated? This is what we've done in Uganda. So we, we try to say that all, everybody should be involved in palliative care at curriculum level. Most people who are looking after chronic illness also need some skills, and then we need some specialist skills, and we need to support them with tools. You can find a lot of the papers and research we've done uh, looking at the website I gave you earlier for cardis.org.uk. What can we see? We can see nurses on surgical wards, medical wards, sickle cell clinics, taking on board this concept. And I love this com comment here. This has changed me and changed my attitude. And Esther is now a wonderful palliative care nurse. Engaging with the community. Here's community volunteers uh, in the refugee areas. And look what they said. And I didn't tell them uh, about my uh, passion for transformation. They said, now I have been transformed, I will transform my own community. And a brave young healthcare worker telling me that his character was changed. Transformational learning. Tessiseko Dominic uh, was an Ascari, still is an Ascari, but as a result of his engagement in palliative care, his training, his community um, discussions and talks, um, he actually then stood for local council and has become the local mayor and still sees palliative care as at the heart of his community work. Or Philip, a refugee from South Sudan, an incredibly impressive young man who is taking the principles of palliative care and saying, let us rebuild the resilience in our own communities to care for our own people. And hopes to, well, he's had a scholarship now to study social work. And I think this young man will do amazing things for God in his community and beyond. And engaging our policymakers. Uh, this is the MP uh, for the area who came to our training, our, our stakeholder meeting, which always gets more people along, but also uh, the, the faith leaders talking about God's love being demonstrated in what we were doing. What about training our postgraduates? Uh, we, we engage with postgraduates from all different specialties, from family medicine through to internal medicine, 
And I love this quote because it's talking again about transformation, seeing people as people, not diseases, being able to engage in difficult conversations, being careful not to induce additional financial pain, seeing them as part of a family. And our Gaza medical students, I asked them what they'd learned. And I loved this list of values. It's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Love, compassion, dignity, respect, and so on. I think they really understood the principles of palliative care. And we've engaged in a lot of leadership training and research training, hugely important if we're to really build and support and mentor our colleagues. And research, let's not miss that out. If you're a researcher on this call, there is so much to be done in palliative care. And I love to embed it in routine practice so that everybody becomes a researcher. But here's Les Damkwaya, who I have the privilege of working with uh, with one of the first PhDs in Uganda in palliative care. And going into these really fragile settings, I just want to give you snapshots. We went up into this community, we were involved in situational analysis and training and needs assessment. And what did we find? Most people living on less than a dollar a day, nearly everyone in semi-permanent housing and um, struggles with access to food and water. And we saw hugely hugely high levels of distress. And I've got a number of different tools we've used for this, but we need to understand that better. We need to look at how we meet the distress that we see. Some of it will be physical, but much of it will be social. And we're using tools such as community generated data to understand this more so that we can then begin to actually meet the needs that the people who are experiencing them have rather than the ones that we're ready to do. Empowering communities, India has been at the forefront of this. And there's a new movement called Compassionate Communities to get everybody engaged in palliative care. But what does that mean for fractured communities? Again, you see that the director of the cancer hospital I have the privilege of working with in Gaza, saying our people are in pain and we have to act. And our indigenous communities, are we listening to them? Are we listening to them? I have the privilege of, of working with young Inghalom Haukip, who's a professor of theology in Manipur in India, talks about this concept of kanko, life in tune with the culture, love and fairness and justice and connectedness. Just an amazing way to understand our interaction with the planet and with God and with one another. And transforming lives like little Jackie, who had cerebral malaria. And in our needs assessment, we saw patients with polio, with yellow fever, many malaria with acquired brain injury. And this needs to be addressed. Or this young, this, this elderly gentleman with head and neck cancer who wanted to be at home, where is the primary care? Or this lady whose son had been wandering for years with untreated or poorly managed schizophrenia and a colleague of mine who's looking at the interface of palliative care and mental health. Or our first patient in Uganda when we set up the service who had a fungating wounds so smelly he was put in the side of the room and who saw palliative care as a way that God was answering his prayers. Or Diane, who said to us, after all of her complex problems, she's got subacute uh, bacterial endocarditis on the back of an abnormal heart valve and renal problems and really a huge amount of uh, um, medical problems. I said to her, what would you like for us most? And she said, please don't abandon me. And for someone like Rose, she was an HIV um, advocate and became an advocate also for palliative care. And she said this at a national conference, palliative care gave her hope, it gave her pain control, very important, and it gave her love and make sure everyone has this care. And so I just finished by asking you, what gives you hope? Do you restore your hope when you're engaging in suffering, engaging in challenge? Do you restore hope? Where do you go to restore hope? Here's some of the things we talk about when we talk about hope and breaking bad news, hope and tender conversations, meaning and connection and comfort and love and hope and presence and strength. And ultimately, we find that in that deep relationship with a loving God who has forgiven us, who has saved us, who's given us the ability to have a relationship with us and the privilege of walking in his purposes and plans. And this is one hope that I love and I think of often when I'm walking that journey with people. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. Thank you for listening. I look forward to our discussions. There are some more links. I'll put them up on the screen just for a moment if people want to take them down. But over to you, John. Thank you, Dr. Lang. That was just wonderful to hear. Um, I'm firstly relieved that your um, power stayed on because it would have been a disaster if I had to take the reins. What a joy to, to hear you share with us. So thank you very much indeed. So we've got uh, time for questions now, but I think just a, a huge thank you because, um, and what really struck me about what you were saying, there was just that inadequacy, that map you showed of particularly the, at near the beginning, um, but the in inequalities of palliative care between uh, between nations and um, an opportunity for us today, I think to, to pause and lament that, but what you're calling us to is very much action and to say well actually compassion moves in action that there's injustice here and that we're, we're to be called to seek seek justice um, as christian healthcare professionals so i'm, I'm very inspired um, from what you shared with us and i'm sure that there are many attending today and are watching this who are perhaps thinking this is something that i need to be involved in and i need to respond to so i would encourage you if that's you to look at those resources um, there's so much there that we can follow up on so yeah, so I think um, one, one thing that just as we've got a few questions coming through, um, one is really um, a, a specific question about um, syringe pumps for, for, from Rachel. It says, what, what about syringe pumps? Are there any countries that do particularly well or badly with them? Because um, she's found that actually in some countries it's challenging just to access enough you know, supplies, the opiates to supply yeah. them. What's your experience with those syringe pumps? Okay. so. I think you've got to tailor, you know, what, what you have in the setting. There's some things that are absolutely essential, and, and it, you, you'll find if you want on those on our website or in other places, essential medicines and things that we need. I don't use syringe pumps in low, most low and middle income settings because, in fact, and I learned this in India, four hourly subcut injections using a butterfly or a similar simple needle work just as well. And unless you've got the staffing and the experience and the access to, to a maintenance, and um, they actually become problematic. So we just simply put in a, a, a subcutaneous butterfly in India. Families are taught to do that. And in, in Uganda, it's, it's staff, it's nurses. But I think use what you've got. And in general, unless you've got a really good health system and people who know what they're doing, I don't use syringe pumps. But I do use a subcutaneous route and not the IV route. And that's the point. We do not want to be trying to find veins and trying to find venous access. And uh, when people are very, very unwell for end of life care, um, that answers that question. Very much. No, that, that's great. Um, and of course, that's assuming that, that, that palliative care is appropriate. There is, there is a question here, which is an intriguing one. And as a Christian pr practitioner, how, how do you approach the question about healing and palliative care? Because the, it may well be that people are saying, look, actually, we're, we're praying for healing and that we, we're not keen on the palliative care route. Now, yeah. that's certainly familiar to me so, in the UK setting. How, yeah. how was your experience? So I think, you know, every place I've worked, every country, there's a process of adjustment to any serious illness. And in that process of adjustment can be pushing away in the diagnosis, can be taking hold of treatments, which we might find a bit wacky or a bit off the wall or maybe downright dangerous. I would see that our job is not to fight that and get into a battle most of the time, but to really listen and to really walk that journey with people to help them avoid dangerous options and so what I say to people is that God has given us these skills, has given us these options, has given us these tools. So let us do those things together. Let's continue to pray with you. Uh, let's let's uh, plan for what we can see now. And if that changes, if God does something, then we'll celebrate together. And not to see that you have to sort of ditch your faith um, in order to have conventional medicine. I ask my postgrads in Uganda every year who believes in miracles. And at least 90% in that classroom do. But they're also all doing internal medicine as a postgrad. And I think we need to, to see ourselves as complementary and to help people get through that adjustment and maybe the denial that's there. And also introduce palliative care early. Make it something that all of us are doing. So you don't even ask, have to necessarily ask for the palliative care doctor. I hope those young internal medicine doctors, when they're doing the gastro, will do it with a palliative care approach and principles. Uh, so that it becomes as normal and natural as any other aspect of basic medical care. 
Thank you. Yeah, and it was really encouraging to see those those slides where you've got those direct quotes of people who benefited from from that training. There's a question from um, from Howard, um, which says, you know, "Thank you so much for that." Um, you addressed um, training of healthcare workers, but how about ordinary church members yeah. who perhaps have no healthcare background? How would you encourage and how might you encourage them to provide palliative yeah. care to those in our, our communities and churches who are in need? And Howard, that's a great question. And actually one of those groups and in one of those slides that went past, I'm sorry, were family caregivers and community members and the VHTs are actually also community members. And many of them actually come from a faith-based background. There is a great book that Jane Bates wrote some years ago called Bringing Hope, which is specifically a tool to help churches. But I think this is really important. If we mobilize our communities, now that could be the befriending, the social support. In our team in Uganda in the hospital, we have trained volunteers, but actually we also went to our church, um, the church I'm part of, and trained uh, volunteers. I think we do need to do some training, some thinking on, on, on holistic issues, and they're providing pastoral and social care in the community in quite a slum urban community. So the community mobilization is essential, and I feel churches should be at the heart of that community mobilization um, and other faith-based groups to work together. And, and Howard, I think you start from just engaging with your local palliative care providers, looking at some of those tools and thinking, how do we care for those in need and how do we listen to what they would like from us? Yeah. Great question. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. And I suppose slightly linked to that in terms of how we work on the ground, there's a question about how does CareDees work with, with other organisations? How are you seeing yeah. the sort of working together yeah. between different organisations yeah. on the ground? I think partnership is absolutely what it's about and partnerships of course need to be equal and not be uh, you know one side telling the other side what to do and that's why I hope I, I emphasize how much mutual learning there is and I've just I'm in India just now and one of my colleagues from Uganda was the one coming and speaking at the conference about her work in nephrology and palliative care and her PhD work which I'm delighted about. I am um, we have some direct partners and um, and the countries we're currently working in mostly uh, are there again if you go onto our our website, but mostly in India, in, in the Middle East, in Sudan, in Uganda, um, and in Mauritania, but, and in Gaza. But we also uh, engage in a lot of global uh, organizations who themselves have other partnerships. And I listed some of those. So there's the World Hospice and Palliative Care Association, there's national organizations, there's regional organizations, there's the World Palliative Care Association, I think I mentioned that one. And we've just started a new organization which fits with another question I see called PALCHASE, which is palliative care in complex humanitarian settings. Uh, if you're interested in any of these, either get in contact with me or, or look on our website. But we're trying to just begin to develop those networks even beyond, and, and for me, the humanitarian sector is in a sense a slightly neglected sector because most people are chronically living in refugee settings. It doesn't just happen for a few weeks and are disproportionately uh, represented by those with need. Um, I may be answering the same breath because it links in with climate change. We, part of uh, my work is with the Global Health Academy in the University of Edinburgh, and they're very involved in planetary health. And that's where we've come together to look at how fragile settings, planetary health, palliative care, compassion, how those things come together. And in fact, talk about our compassion to the planet, as well as our compassion to one another, and how it's those with chronic illness, often in the most fragile settings, who will uh, come off worse. So we're really thinking about that, looking at research, discussing with a wider planetary health community so that we're, and that's why I went, for example, to listen to some of the indigenous communities to understand more of how we come together to address these problems. Thank you for that. And that, that was a question on the tip of my tongue really about engaging with um, at governmental level at higher levels, because some obviously supply of opiates, for example, there are these there are higher level decision. Uh, how, how can how do we get involved and, and advocate for for people on, on this this broader level? And, and you, okay. you've alluded to yeah. some things that you're involved in. But how can we sort of support that and encourage yeah. change at that level? So policy work is massively important. The people who really need to do the policy work are people in that country. So I think a lot of what we can do when we're partnering is partner together. Now, what is so in Gaza, for example, at the invitation of my colleagues, we meet with the Ministry of Health, we meet with the Ministry of Pharmacy, we see where the gaps are, the problems are, we maybe do a formal situational analysis. Those of you interested in research, there's, there's ways to partner and link and support 
Um, and out of that will then come where the gaps are. And usually they're pretty similar. And so some of that then is providing the evidence. And um, a lot of places want some evidence from their setting to show that this is relevant. And they also need some of the myths disbanded. So I would say have a global health way of thinking. Don't just think about your own setting, but what I mean, you know, have a more global way of thinking. How is what we're doing and we're saying um, impacting globally, for example, on access to opiates when we're becoming very, very concerned in many parts of the world. And yet the biggest problem is the lack of access. And how do we do that safely? So get involved in, in, in global health. Do your integrated, if you're a medical student, your, your, your integrated degrees, uh, degrees in that look at public policy and if you're in working in partnership I see many of you are joining from countries you know being involved with your national and local organizations I, I'm the privilege of being central council for the Indian Association here and they have done a brilliant job it took them 20 years to change the laws here and uh, to make opiates theoretically more accessible and it took 15 minutes with an amazing pharmacist in West Bank that I met a few years ago in Nablus. So, you know, we've got to engage our policymakers, but have your evidence, work with local colleagues and bring in experts. And um, I have the privilege of, of sometimes being that expert and you can bring in colleagues who will just bring a bit of international expertise in and use that WHO um, document. It's been a long time coming, it's brilliant. And that has indicators for everything. So you can look at your setting, where are you with those indicators? Where are the gaps? And who do you need to go to, to to fill those gaps? There are national policy um, fellowships. There's a couple that run out of India. There's ways in which you can get involved in, and that's how I got involved in the very beginning. I came as a, a, a young consultant to a conference and from there came my partnerships and links with India, which are now in their 24th year. So to get, you know, see where you can get involved. And um, if you want any more help, do ask me. Um, I can see. Super, thank you. Thanks so much. And just a reminder for those who are joining us, we have Dr. Leng talking about palliative care and transforming um, and, uh, settings, particularly in fragile settings, um, that transformative palliative care. And it's great to have all these questions. I think there's a couple of questions people have put in the chat. If you have, if you could put those in the Q&A box so we can see them and that will give us a chance to, to answer them. Uh, we can answer those now. So um, just you were talking a bit about training there. And what I just wanted to, to say is lovely to see um, a number of nurses joining us. We've got um, nurses from all over the place, actually, which is which is great from the UK to Lesotho to India. Um, and there's actually um, a question about uh, education and training for, for nurses who serve in, in palliative care. And I've uh, my, wife, my wife is one of those. Um, so particularly this is a question about places where palliative care isn't as advanced, a lower resource setting, what are the most critical education training needs for, for nurses? Yeah, and nurses, absolutely the backbone, backbone of any healthcare system, particularly in uh, low and middle, middle, middle income settings. And um, you may know that Uganda was the first country in the whole world where nurses and clinical officers were allowed to prescribe morphine after a particular training and a law change. And I'm privileged to work with some of those first batch of amazing nurses and um, I think the competencies are fairly well worked out there's competencies around those domains of physical care of, of social care of um, uh, psychological care and spiritual care so you'll find those competency documents uh, on our website and other places and then you need to integrate those into the levels of training so what does every nurse there for a pre-curriculum training need and remember that transformational approach so how does what we're doing um, impact the way we do it and also our, how does it challenge our beliefs I see another question there about beliefs and really if we're operating at the level of hope and meaning and purpose and despair and distress it immediately takes us into those places so there will be then the need for for nurses we call them link nurses which are Malawi's done something similar in, in a Emmanuel Hospital Association I see as uh, Shashi is joining from there they use a similar model so you get a link person, often a nurse who does a bit of extra training and has mentored into that training, and then they can be the link person in their ward area. And that's been a model we've worked for 15 years in Uganda and in many other countries. Um, but the important thing, of course, is then how do they work in a team? And sometimes our doctors need to learn from nurses. Um, we teach our medical students with our nurses teaching them and our postgrads. So we need to model that multidisciplinary way of working and it's not that nurses don't need doctors and vice versa and all the rest of the healthcare team and the community 
and the faith-based organizations, but we need to find ways to work together. And there is need for specialist training. There are some ways of doing that in different parts of the world. There are some programs, for example, I've been in Uganda for some time and there's a right up to master's level training there and in South Africa. Not always easy, but there are places there. And some of those global organizations I mentioned have maps of where you can find providers of education. And I'm very happy, again, to help point you in that direction if you'd like more information about a particular country or setting. Um, yeah. Can I just mention Shashi's comment while I'm there, because he's talking about wrong beliefs. It's, a, it's an interesting question, Shashi, and I, I suppose we don't have time for me to ask you what we mean by wrong. I think one of the biggest privileges listening, and um, there's a, a famous palliative care colleague here in India, known as the father of palliative care, who stuck the word listen all over his, his, um, his consulting room. And I think if we're really listening and we're understanding why people believe what they believe, letting them tell us why they believe, we may be able to walk with them on a journey of change and of restoration and of healing. And I think healing is far, far more than the absence of disease. And, and, I, and I know my church in Uganda, I'm always saying to them, please don't just have testimonies of a disease going away through healing, that conventional idea of healing. But what about attitudes changed? What about peace and grace in the midst of suffering? What about stories of God's faithfulness in the midst of trial of, of those, that picture of we do walk through the water, we do go through the fire, but we're not consumed. So in that places of walking, I think it's, I think it's the Holy Spirit that transforms, isn't it, and changes. And that it includes beliefs, but it starts, I think, as offering dignity and listening and the presence of just the being space with people and allowing that journey to take place by God's grace. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that was there's a cluster of questions that I think do you know, cluster around the beliefs. Questions, one from Rachel about um, how we address the, the dangling of, of cures. Um, so you've got on the one hand, kind of, uh, people who will reject cures and reject intervention um, and go with some traditional, but other families who out of desperation will go to healthcare services and are offered, you know, chemotherapy, even immunotherapy, when it's just clearly not appropriate, um, costing lots and lots of money, offering false hope. H how do we address that level? Yeah, there's a belief going on there as well, but there's also a lot of corruption and um, sad things happening. There is, there is. And, and you find that everywhere. You find it even within, you know, Christian churches. I see people who are go off to the healing center to give a lot of money and, to, and are told to stop their, their medications, for example. Again, I come back to that place of if you have a relationship and a rapport with your patient, and if you engage the community leaders, for example, some of those spiritual leaders will come to training if you offer it. And you can sit and discuss some of those ideas. And, and some of those ways in which we might be complementary, or it just might be pure and simple corruption, as you say. I think the important thing with that individual patient is to walk that journey with them and to develop, develop a trust relationship and a holistic care relationship so that you can help, help in those choices. You can at least give some of the information and support to make those choices well, and not to make it into a battle. You know, the conversation is say, today, together with you, we'd like to find out what would help you best. And I'd like to help you and um, to give you advice and what if you would like that advice, rather than you mustn't do this. And if you do that, you can't have my care anymore. When there's frank corruption, now that's when the justice comes in, isn't it? So how are we setting up services? How are we working within health systems? I mostly work in government health systems. And I feel very passionate about that because most of the poor people in, in settings are in health, government health systems. Um, how do we make do something about the values of a health system? That's why I talked about that transformational piece. And I work with amazing colleagues, you know, so they don't want corruption in their health system either. So there are things in which we need to be engaging at policy level, at justice level. Uh, and those things can be tough and can be painful. So look after yourself there. Look after your own values, your own um, principles, your own health, your own relationship with God. And engage in the battles you feel God has for you. And almost certainly it's going to be both. Um, I talked to an amazing doctor in Gaza recently, a Christian, um, and I asked him just about his experience of life uh, living under that 
uh, occupation and, and the difficulties of the siege, but also about his faith. And he said, I think God's called me to love people. And that's what I do. And I was privileged to go to the church there a few times. And I was really, really humbled, actually, by his very, in some ways, simple, in other ways, incredibly profound, that he says, my job is to love people. And I think if you love people, then you hate the things that destroy them and that harm them. And you engage with them in how to change them. Thank Can I just answer that. the Lebanon question, John, because that's an easy one. Yes, it's, quite, it's a quite good palliative care in Lebanon. It's called Balsam, a place called Sanad. Have a wee look. If you go into the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care or the World Hospice and Palliative Care Association, those websites have a list of providers. So look for them. If you get stuck, do send me uh, a message and we can help you. But there are, even if that map is not the right colour, there often are individuals or settings or people who can give advice or networks in those regions and countries. Thank you. I, I, I hope you don't mind me asking you a personal question. I mean, you're, you're obviously engaged in thinking, talking, engaging with patients who are dying, who are in deep distress. And I think not just on a one to one level, but on a on a broader scale, it's distressing to see the inequalities and injustice. Mm -hmm. What is it that sustains you and your and your as, as a person and as a doctor um, in the face of this of this distress? How, how do yeah. you keep going? Yeah, very, very good question. Thank you. And it's one I don't have all the answers to, but I can tell you some of my journey. And, and I think like many of us, you know, you have a good intentions. And then you discover actually that you've become too exhausted and too tired and, and that can really impact on how you do your, your job. I mean, I come right back to the, the basis of what we were talking about before. If we're not spiritually nourished, if we're not spiritually healthy, if we don't have a sense of meaning and purpose. We can't engage meaningfully with people who are going through those difficult times. Now, I know people bring lots of different ways of spiritual connectedness in. And, and I think that can include as simple as I spent some days last week working by the Arabian Sea and listening to the ocean and watching some sunsets. And I love photography and, 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 and the beauty of nature. Um, create, make sure you value and your Christian community, wherever that is, your faith community. Um, I'm privileged to be part of a wonderful church in, in Uganda and part of a, an online community as well. I'm part of the wider Christian Medical Fellowship and ICMDA community. I know Fee's on this call. And, and that's a great community in the UK and there's others. I think also for me, the connectedness, that's something I've learned from my years of working in um, settings that are less autonomy driven, that actually the togetherness, the being, the going through things together. We were, I was at a, a friend's daughter's the, the evidence, and we were just talking about going through uh, difficult times together and helping make meaning of that, particularly talking about some of the issues in COVID and the losses and the distress that the carers, the doctors had felt when they couldn't save their relatives and how hard that was. So those are the your spiritual components, your uh, sense of meaning and purpose, what gives you joy, what gives you um, love and hope um, and make sure you build those into your life as well as times of rest and relaxation. Um, it's the most wonderful job, I would say, the most incredible privilege. But yes, the cost is high too. I think the cost is high whenever the Lord asks us to step out of our comfort zones, move a bit closer to the edge. But his grace and his mercy are there if we lean on them. And his strength is there. And walking in his purposes is the best possible place to be. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're, we're almost out of time. We're going to close in just a moment. But is there anything you anything else you'd just like to say that, that comes to mind um, before we close, Dr. Ling? No, just an encouragement to everyone. Thank you for joining this call. Thank you for your interest. Um, I can see some lots of ideas there on culture and debriefing and so much more to discuss. Please do keep engaged. Please do uh, look in and ask that question of yourself. Where today am I finding hope? Where am I finding joy? And then out of that well uh, that the Lord fills for us, you'll be able to overflow mm -hmm. and to do just the job that you have to do. You've heard about my journey. You all have your own journeys and your own purpose. The Lord has called you to. And I wish you every blessing. And thank you. That's right. Well, thank you. And we just so appreciate you giving your time and, and energy to share with us today. That's been, been a great joy. And I think there's just a, a remark in the, the Q&A that sums it up that, you know, thank you for reminding us. Uh, that by attending to the sick that we're fulfilling 
the I was sick and you visited me uh, mm -hmm. command, uh, even before we apply specific palliative care, care skills, what a joy and a privilege it is. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for attending. Thank you for giving your time uh, to attend today. So may God bless you. Uh, have a great rest of the day. And Dr. Lang, thank you again for being with us. God bless you and all that you're doing.